Good morning, and welcome to Talks at Google in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Tom Kleins. Tom is a science journalist, photographer, and professional speaker. He's covered environmental issues, energy, and science stories around the world, taking memorable photos along the way. He's here today to talk about his latest book. In 2010, as contributing editor for Popular Science magazine, he wrote about a community of nuclear physics enthusiasts, hobbyists who were reproducing in labs they'd built themselves what scientists were accomplishing in, lab in the world's most sophisticated research facilities. One of these amateurs was a 14-year-old boy from Texarkana who had just become one of 32 people to build a working nuclear fusion reactor. The story Tom wrote turned into the book he's here to discuss today, The Boy Who Played With Fusion, Extreme Science, Extreme Parenting, and How to Make a Star. It's the extraordinary account of how one exceptionally gifted young man, Taylor Wilson, with nearly endless patience and support from his parents and allies, realized his early potential. Emphasis on the patience and support. Taylor's limitless curiosity and outsized personality have made him a force of nature on par with those he's worked to harness. This is also, I'm guessing, the only book any of us will read this year that describes a pivotal event in these terms. The moment where a small boy stirred his dying grandmother's pee. There's something unexpected on just about every page here. Uh, in the Q&A, you might ask Tom about um, quack radium cures in the 1920s if you want to get into unexpected things. In the meantime, please join me in welcoming Tom Kleins. OK. Well, thank you, John. Appreciate sure. it. And thanks, everyone, for coming out. So I want to tell you a story about the youngest person on Earth to achieve a nuclear fusion reaction. But uh, beyond that, I think what's more interesting is, is what he chose to do with his machine that he built. And, and we'll get into some of that today. The uh, story is, is basically a science adventure story. It also ventures into the outer realms of uh, giftedness, and genius, and creativity, and more than anything, parenting. In fact, uh, I started off thinking that this was a book about a kid. But I really thought, after <laughs> getting into it, that uh, it was a book about parenting. And um, Taylor himself, I, I would say the, the things that he's accomplished and the things that he continues to accomplish are as much a result of having extraordinary parents and being gifted with those parents as they are with his intellectual gifts. And so we'll talk a little bit about um, what it means to parent a genius or, or uh, a, ch a child with any sort of gifts. Because when we talk about ac academic uh, giftedness, we're really talking about 10% or up to 10% of the population in the US. But there's other kinds of giftedness. There's uh, artistic giftedness. There's uh, musical giftedness and uh, athletic giftedness, all kinds of things. In fact, um, just about everybody, had, the latest science suggests, has the capacity to work at an expert level or a sort of world-changing level in some domain of expertise. The real trick is finding and matching that, those gifts with the right domain. And when you do find that match, especially if you find it early in your, in your life or in a child's life, it's amazing how quickly things can, can happen. So the story, as, as John said, uh, started with a 2010 popular science story. And I, I was really interested in the high energy amateur science community, these, these people that were doing things like splitting atoms in their garages and, and make, fusing atomic nuclei in their basement. And, building particle accelerators, and really doing things that mostly people do at these large uh, state-funded uh, research laboratories. But they were doing them as individuals. So 
I started getting into this community. And I was really interested that these people were had mastered both the formidable physics of nuclear fusion and other sorts of high energy physics, and also the hands-on sort of engineering skills. And you know, really, uh, something that Taylor did requires some expertise in about 40 different scientific and technical fields, everything from uh, nuclear engineering and, and plasma physics to vacuum technology, which is something I don't think you can even go to school for. It's sort of a, a black art. You have to really figure it out by having mentors and doing it yourself and trial and error. So the story for me was, was a departure from what I usually do because it was so incredibly optimistic. I typically cover things like Ebola epidemics and uh, scientific slap fights that end careers. Um, the battle over climate change and the people trying to influence that debate, or um, some eco-mercenaries in Central Africa trying to protect rhinos and elephants, and the, um, some of their hard-drinking friends that came along for the ride. Actually, we, we rescued this guy from a bushmeat market while we were on that, that assignment, and uh, he quickly learned to swipe our beers. We didn't actually give him beers, and, and uh, we wouldn't, but you couldn't set a beer down for more than a, a couple seconds without this chimp running over and grabbing your beer and running up on, in a tree and laughing at you while he downed the bottle. <laughs> so yeah, for me, getting into something like this um, was really, really different. Taylor is a really, I, he's not your typical science nerd. You know, he's, he's not over in the corner sort of skulking at the science fair or, or you know, he, he's very switched on. He's very, very eyes up, very, very hands on. He's very good at drawing people into his orbit and, and you know, talking people into things, and talking people out of things. And he's been like this ever since he was a child. When he was very small, his, his parents said, yeah, this, is, this was a really hard kid to keep on the ground. When he was five, he got into uh, construction, like a lot of boys do. In fact, my sons, Charlie and Joe, are, are here. And uh, they were into construction, too. But Taylor took it a little bit farther. He didn't have, want anything to do with toys, construction toys, Tonka trucks, and things like that. For his fifth birthday, his parents took him to a uh, Toys R Us store and said, pick out any, any crane, because he said he wanted a crane. And he stomped his feet, and he said, no, I want a real one. And so this is about the time when most dads would put their own feet down and say, you know, what am I going to do? Get, well, his dad actually called a friend to bring over a crane for his fifth birthday party, and the uh, kids all sat on the lap of the operator while they swung the boom. This, is, this isn't it, actually. Swung the boom over the, the uh, rooftops in the neighborhood. And um, so that gives you an idea about this, this sort of intellectual spoiling that was going on in this household and, and the sort of very interesting and, and extreme, I, I would say, intellectual indulgence that was happening. Taylor got into space next. A lot of kids do that too. Myself, that's what I was into when I was a kid. But his parents would do things like they'd take him out of school to visit places like Huntsville's um, US Space and Rocket Center or, the, um, or Cape Canaveral for a launch of a shuttle. They said, you know, we never had any qualms about him missing a test or his little brother missing a test to do something they wanted to do because you know, we thought it might inform something later. And I kind of look at that as sort of helicopter parenting 2.0, in that uh, you know instead of uh, the parents piloting the helicopters and taking the kids where they you know want to go and hoovering over them, you're actually letting the kids pilot the helicopters. The parents jump on board with the with the supplies, the the fuel, the mentors, the experiences, and. It, from what I can tell, researching the book, it talked to dozens and dozens of uh, child psychologists, creativity experts, and others. This is really the way you want to cultivate a kid's talents, and especially in the early years when early novel experiences are, are super important for, for developing these parts of the brain. They can actually see it in, in scans that the brain development is different when kids have early novel experiences. And, um, now, that doesn't mean stressful, super stressful novel experiences all the time. That can be very destructive. They've seen that in scans, too. And um, it, it's a big part of uh, research right now. 
But um, Taylor was indulged, got into chemistry, he got into building his own rockets. He wanted to make its rockets go higher and higher, and he was buying uh, bigger and bigger rockets, bigger and bigger engines, started building his own rockets. Then he was running out of money to buy the engines to propel the rockets. He wanted to get them up as high as they do in the Black Rock Desert when you have to get FAA approval to shoot them off. So he started making his own rocket fuel. Well, that meant that he had to master chemistry. And then he started making his own biodiesel, which he tried to talk his dad into putting into his uh, fleet of Coca-Cola trucks. And keep in mind, both his parents had no scientific training whatsoever. Dad was a Coca-Cola bottler, mom a yoga instructor. They both would say, we didn't know a dang thing about science. They're in southern Arkansas in Texarkana. This is not by any means a technical hotbed in, in the US. Not much infrastructure at all. But uh, Taylor was, was mixing up uh, rocket fuel, biodiesel. He, then he got into, um, instead of seeing how high his rockets would go, he got into seeing how spectacularly he could blow them up when, he, when they got up in the air. So yeah, I guess you know, sort of only a matter of time, just like the Chinese with fireworks. And, and soon he was putting on really spectacular fireworks demonstrations all over the neighborhood. And Fourth of July was always a big thing around their house. Um, his parents didn't do, and this becomes even more apparent later on, they didn't do what most of us sort of intuitively do, which is keep our kids away from things that can kill them. They actually found ways to help him learn how to do things safely. How to, they found ways to bring people into his life and bring experiences into his life and bring knowledge into his life so that he could do these things that are pales in comparison to blowing a few things up in the driveway. He was uh, 10 years old, and um, it was his birthday. And his grandmother said, hey, let's go to the bookstore. I want to get you a, any book you want for your birthday. And Taylor went right to the science section, of course. And he picked out this book called The Radioactive Boy Scout. Has anyone read that or know of it? It was uh, a kid in suburban Detroit who uh, started with the, the uh, nuclear energy scout badge and then took it really far and tried to build a breeder reactor in his uh, backyard shed. And it eventually led to a uh, super fun cleanup of the, of the, uh, the house and, and part of the neighborhood. And uh, the terrified neighbors watching the, the belongings being carted away and eventually led to an arrest and, and uh, really sort of went in the op opposite direction as Taylor. And his parents, uh, this, the kid's name is David Hahn, his parents really were the opposite of Taylor's parents. They didn't give him any support at all. They said, hey, you know, we just don't want you doing this. You do this again, you're going to be in trouble. So he ended up going underground with it with, with almost disastrous results. But Taylor's parents took him to uh, nuclear facilities around the country and uh, gave him a Geiger counter for his, for his uh, 10th birthday. Um, he started collecting uranium at uh, abandoned mines. And this is one that we visited um, when he was a late teenager in the Virginia mountains north of Reno, and uh, went into the mine, started digging around, and found some nice, nice uranium nuggets. And then Taylor discovered that his pants were radioactive on the way out, and was, uh, was quite concerned about it, and uh, pulled them off, and um, ended up um, wearing my, my sh extra shorts for the rest of the trip. Never did figure out where it came from. But um, another thing they did, as part of their nuclear tourism as a family was visit uh, Los Alamos and some of the desert sites. This is a, uh, oh, you can't even read it, but it says, um, do not disturb until the year 2142 AD. It's a marker in place at Technical Area 10 outside of Los Alamos where they did the, the RELA tests for the um, Fat Man bomb. Um, the summer soon became filled with trips like this for Taylor and his little brother Joey tailored out in the desert to scan around for radioactive materials. And as Tiffany, his mom, said, uh, yeah, this is how we spend our vacations. But then things got a really a bit more scary. Taylor started collecting things. And it's amazing what you can get on eBay still, as long as you don't call it radioactive. Um, because essentially, the people that are monitoring this kind of thing are completely inept. If you don't call it nuclear or radioactive or other certain key phrases, you can sell just about anything by describing it kind of 
what it is, but not with using certain keywords. Uh, Taylor started bringing home things that literally glowed in the dark. He started taking apart the old computer monitors from his school, building an x-ray machine by, by reversing things around, um, learning to use shielding for that. He started uh, collecting things like spent fuel rods from the um, Keir McGee plant where uh, Karen Silkwood worked. And at some point, well, all along, his parents were, were very concerned about safety. So they're bringing in you know, various people, trying to figure out you know, what, is what he's doing safe? And, um, but they really didn't know. When Tiffany and Kenneth questioned him about safety, Taylor spoke convincingly, if bafflingly, about time doses and distance intensities of inverse square laws and Rentgen submultiples. He explained the different types of radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, x-ray, and how they dictated the amount and kind of shielding necessary. With his new phone, newfound knowledge, Taylor insisted, he could master the furtive energy that seeped from his rocks and metals and other collectibles. I know what I'm doing, Taylor reassured his parents. I'm the responsible radioactive Boy Scout. One afternoon, Tiffany ducked her head into Taylor's garage laboratory to call him in for supper. And she saw her son in his yellow hazmat overalls, watching a pool of liquid as it spread from an overturned container across the concrete floor. Tay, it's time for supper. I'm going to have to clean this up first. That's not the stuff you said would kill us if it broke open, Tiffany asked, is it? I don't think so, Taylor said. Not instantly. <laughs> so he started collecting um, a lot of uranium, rocks, ore, and um, about this time, he was 11, he found out that his grandmother was dying. Now, she'd had cancer for a long time. It had been in remission. It came back. And she was really his biggest fan and his closest, the person that was closest to him. And um, Taylor approached this in a very interesting way. He um, asked her for a sample of her urine after she came back from her, um, from her test because it was very radioactive. And then he also asked her for a sample of the tumors that she was coughing up from her lungs. And he said, you know, I, I know this is weird, but interesting, it, it, scientifically it was very interesting to me and, and she indulged me. Taylor was also, his, his mind was working this whole time. He was 11 years old. He didn't want to lose his grandmother. But pretty soon everybody was saying, there's nothing more anyone can do for grandma. And Taylor was thinking, well, gosh, there's got to be something somebody can do. So he'd been thinking about um, how radioactive isotopes are made. And usually they're made in these uh, multi-million dollar cyclotrons. There's only a few in the world. They're shipped very quickly by private jet to distribution facilities around the world. They have to be shipped quickly because their half-lives are so short. They need to get in, light up the tumors, and then decay away before they can do much more damage. So Taylor started thinking, well, I wonder if there's a different way of doing this, because he'd been working with a nuclear pharmacist who um, had uh, become a mentor to him. And um, he'd asked the guy, David Boudreau, so how do people in Africa get these things when they're sick? And he said, well, unfortunately, Taylor, usually they can't. Um, you know, they're not really available. It's just too expensive. So one day, he and I were making some yellow cake in his garage. And um, he told me about this day he was stirring up his grandmother's pee and holding the Geiger counter to it, measuring it. And he got this idea. Well, what about using nuclear fusion to make radioactive uh, medical isotopes? And um, it was a novel idea for an 11-year-old to think of this. So anyway, he, he started thinking, well, if, if I could build a reactor that was small enough and safe enough and cheap enough to put in every electrified hospital on Earth, you know, how many more lives could be saved? How much cheaper could it be? How, much, how many more people could we get these things to? And so at that point, he realized that's what he wanted to do with his life. And uh, the, this notion of um, 
um, I guess a future image of oneself is extremely important in, in the development of most people who have had big creative breakthroughs in their lives. People who have pushed certain uh, fields of knowledge forward. And um, Taylor saw himself as not only doing this thing, but also as being a groundbreaking nuclear physicist when he, when he was older. So this is, would end up propelling him for the next um, several years as he pursued this, this idea. After his grandmother passed away, <clears throat> He started looking into how can I build a nuclear fusion reaction reactor. At this point, only 10 people as individuals had ever done it. And so he started writing to people and, and sort of getting, trying to find somebody that could help him. Well, this was very difficult because of where he lived. How could a, an 11-year-old kid living in, at, in Texarkana ever hope to achieve this kind of thing? But he was an extremely resourceful kid. He was able to find a mentor by the name of Carl Willis and um, eventually would meet him and uh, Kenneth and Tiffany would bring him to meet him in, uh, in Albuquerque. Now, now Carl is a, a nuclear engineer with a PhD and uh, he uh, took Taylor under his wing and um, he was the 10th person to build a working nuclear fusion reactor. And he said, well, Taylor, this is going to be you know, extremely difficult to do. But he never said, you'll never, you'll never do it. In fact, he sent Taylor a, a neutron detector, thinking that someday he might. So I went with these guys to a place called the Black Hole, which is outside of Los Alamos. And it's uh, defunct now, but it is a place where the weapons industry, nuclear weapons industry, says it, sends its surplus gear. So we went shopping there one day for uh, equipment. This is sort of um, Taylor's version of, I guess, of a, a light bulb going off over his head. But uh, he scanned the aisle, aisles and came out with some stuff and filled a shopping cart and um, had some conflat fittings and some, um, some detectors and a lot of spare parts and brought it up and, to the checkout and uh, he said, um, all right, mom, I want to buy this stuff. And she says, what do you want this stuff for? And she, he says, uh, I want to build a second uh, reactor for the house. And she said, Taylor, you are not going to build a nuclear reactor in the house. But he ended up coming away with this stuff. As I said, he was very good at talking people into things. So he would do things like um, he found out that a, an astronaut in Houston was selling a mass spectrometer, an instrument um, that Taylor could cannibalize for parts for his particle accelerator and his, his fusers. So the guy wanted several thousand dollars for this thing, and, and Taylor just called him up and said, um, hey, you know, I'm 11 years old, and I was wondering if you'd consider donating it to me for the um, nuclear fusion reactor I want to build. <laughs> this is the way this kid's life works, right? This is just the way things roll for him. And the guy said, well, can you come pick it up? <laughs> so. His dad got one of the Coca-Cola trucks to go down to Houston and pick it up, and, and Taylor started putting this thing together. Well, again, he was now 12, 13, and lacking really the expertise or the mentors to be able to pull this off, especially where he lived. Now, with any gifted kids, if, if any of you have kids that are gifted, um, you're going to run up against a problem that Kenneth and Tiffany ran up against, which is the schools. The schools in this country, by and large, just can't handle these kids. We had a sort of golden age of uh, specialized gifted education after Sputnik, when you know, suddenly we saw America's smartest kids as being a, a national resource and, and uh, a national security resource, even. And so a lot of energy, money was put into developing science labs, developing learning opportunities, acceleration, uh, special opportunities for kids. As, as soon as uh, the Cold War ended, the interest in gifted kids really started to fade. And then you had um, a sort of anti-elitist movement that was going on in the 80s, where the thought of segregating kids because they're smart was thought to be maybe not such a good idea because, well, well, are the other kids getting a second class education? And if those kids that were smart happen to be already advantaged um, socially, race, class, 
then it was even more problematic. But um, in any case, gifted education programs began to go out of fashion. And they disappeared most quickly in the more PC communities like Cambridge and Ann Arbor, Michigan, where my kids go to school. Um, one, of the, one of the things I, I encountered in my research was that they were trying to figure out, you know, what do we do with these programs? We can't, we don't, we're not going to have um, any more pulling these kids out of, these of, of their regular classrooms. We're going to have to figure out some other way of doing this. And um, so the school system in Ann Arbor uh, in the mid-90s did a survey of parents. And um, this is in every college town, it would probably be the same. They asked the parents all kinds of things about gifted education, other kinds of education. One of the questions was, are your ki own kids gifted? Well, in a college town, what do you think was the response to that, that question? What percentage of respondents answered, yes, my own kids are gifted? It turns out that 99% of parents <laughs> in Ann Arbor, Michigan, thought that. And I have no doubt that Cambridge would be pretty much the same. Uh, but, you know, it's not a, actually, you know, it doesn't take an evolutionary biologist or, or psychologist to understand why we all think that our kids deserve special treatment and why we think our own kids are gifted. I mean, I've got two geniuses here in the front row. And um, the thing is that, you know, the same developmental processes really guide the development of gifts, whether you, at, at, no matter what level you're working at. And as I said before, it, it really, everyone is gifted in, certain, in some way. There's some sort of specialty that everybody's going to be great at if you manage to match them with the right thing. So for Taylor, what happened was that schools just weren't going to do the job. He spent most of his time waiting. And that's the response that uh, researchers got when they asked gifted kids across the country you know, what's your school experience? Most of them said, Can you, waiting, describe it in one word, waiting, always waiting for the rest of the class to catch up, waiting for the teacher to teach something that I don't already know. So they ended up finding the school in Reno, Nevada, and uh, deciding to move there. It's a public school for kids that score in the 99.9 percentile on the standardized test. It's called Davidson Academy, and um, it's parked on the campus of the University of Nevada, Reno. So Taylor went there. He, he, it turns out the physics department's quite good there. So he was very happy about that and ended up uh, there and ended up finding mentors there. He uh, found, went to some professors. So he was turned down once and went to the guy next door and by the name of Ron Fanouf, a famous plasma physicist, and said, hey, I want to build a nuclear fusion reactor. And I want to do it in my garage. And Taylor said, well, uh, or Ron said, well, my, my God, we can't have you do it in your garage, but maybe we could figure out a way for you to try it here in the sub-basement of the physics lab. So that's exactly what they did. So Ron and um, Bill Brinsmead, the uh, physics department's tech chief technician, a super eccentric and, and fascinating guy, ended up becoming Taylor's mentors. And they worked with him over many months to eventually build help him build this nuclear fusion reactor. And he mastered all these, these technical fields and uh, eventually got it to work, got neutrons, and um, was um, recognized for it. He became the 32nd person on Earth to achieve nuclear fusion as an individual. Um, here he is running the, the control panel of the machine. And here is the, um, the grid with the plasma field around it. What was most interesting, though, about this, uh, this machine was not really it, it's the machine itself, but what he did with it. So we went together once to a field outside of the airport of Albuquerque International Airport, which is shared with the Sandia um, Air Force Base. And it turns out that a really weird thing happened there in the 50s, 1957, when a nuclear bomb was accidentally dropped in a field. At, on approach. And it was probably the, the sort of closest to Dr. Strangelove moment that the Air Force has ever had, where the, one of the crewmen was sent back to check on the bomb to make sure it was secure and ended up pulling the wrong lever. The bomb dropped from its um, platform onto the bomb bay doors, forced them open, and then fell 
3,000 feet and exploded in a field. Now, luckily, the plutonium core wasn't in it, or you know, all of Albuquerque would be gone, gone, gone. But there was a lot of radioactive material in it, this so-called spark plug that surrounds the plutonium core. And the, Taylor got his hands on some declassified documents and found out where this had happened, or roughly where it happened, and went out and found it. And they said they had cleaned it up. But we've ended up finding all kinds of radioactive debris there. There's, there's Taylor and Carl looking at it. So the first time he went there, he was shipping it home in, uh, in a box through the, at the airports. And TSA looked at it. They had a, a piece of white tape across it when he took it off the bag check. And um, there was a little note inside that said, we checked this. And Taylor said, wow, they had no idea what they were looking at. They, they weren't checking radioactive for, for radiation. radiation. So he started thinking about the uh, tens of thousands of shipping containers that entered the US every month, every week, actually, about 10,000 a day, I think. And they're sort of the soft underbelly as far as nuclear security in that um, hardly any of them are checked. And uh, when they are, it just slows down everything. And it's very hard. So he had got this idea to develop a detector that, could, that trucks could drive through. And it could uh, shoot a, a directed neutron beam at the contents. And if there were any fissionable materials inside the box, it would pick them up and alert the operator. It would also pick up nitrogen signals, signatures from any conventional explosives. So he took this to the science fair. And um, the first year he was there, he just entered the reactor and, and uh, uh, some neutron multiplication stuff. And it was sort of like, wow, a kid shows up at the science fair with a nuclear reactor. I mean, it's like a Ferrari showing up at a soapbox derby, right? So he wins big in physics. The second year, he wins bigger. The third year, he ends up with the security uh, application. And, and he wins it all. He wins the young, Intel Young, young Scientist Award. And, and, becomes this, this superstar. And um, a $50,000 award with several other awards stacked on top of it, a trip to CERN in Switzerland. And then I do my story in popular science. So his life starts to get really interesting. So, so Chris Anderson, who curates TED, got a hold of the, um, the story in pop sci and said, my god, we got to get this kid to talk at TED. Taylor's only prepared for one talk in his life, and it was a disaster. This one, he didn't prepare at all for. He, his only preparation was calling me an hour and a half before he was due to go on stage and saying, hey, Tom, can you email me some slides? That was it. So the, um, he, he comes back next year. He's getting more and more famous. Uh, he's invited to the National Ignition Facility to uh, give a talk. He's uh, a big shot at his school. I mean, at this school, there's no football team. You know, it, it, you, it doesn't get bigger than, than what he was doing. He's invited to the Halifax Security Conference. Uh, and he's um, sitting between you know, the, the Palestinians and the Israelis and talking about you know, <laughs> how we might be able to get along. <laughs> and then he says to his math teacher one day, um, hey, uh, can I have the homework ahead of time? I got to go to Washington. What's going on in Washington? Well, I got to go meet the president. Sure enough, he's invited to talk to Obama. And some other kids were there, too. Obama's talking to every kid, and so oh, nice to see this. And see, these two are, start riffing and, and talking. You know, what do your parents think of all this? This is, this is crazy. And then um, Obama says, um, so when are you going to come work for me? And Taylor says, well, I kind of thought that was why I was here. <laughs> so he, Obama makes the rounds. He comes back to Taylor on the way out, and um, he says, uh, yeah, you're, you're definitely going to be working for me soon. Several people that heard about this you know, thought that it might end up being the other way around, actually, that, that uh, Obama might end up working for Taylor. So he's getting a very, very big profile. So what happens to a teenager when someone is calling him genius and Einstein every day? Um, well, what happened was sort of the dark side of, of this kind of thing, and, and really the dark side of giftedness. And um, he abandoned some of his old friends to have lunch with uh, you know, a new girl that he liked a lot. He was driving everybody crazy at home. 
<clears throat> he was uh, you know, demanding to uh, watch his own TV shows, uh, or shows that featured him, got addicted to the spotlight. Um, and so sometimes by indulging this, this sort of showman thing, these super smart kids learn that if they keep up the, the demands, they'll be met, which really doesn't do them a lot of good in the long run. And this sense of entitlement and you know, a, a really sort of a narcissistic tendency uh, will, you know, sort of the overconfidence, it'll get challenged eventually. It, sometimes a gifted kid, their, their identity, identity will get caught up in being a whiz kid. So sometimes they will stop trying to be anything else than what protects that identity. There's um, some really, really, really interesting uh, educational theories about, uh, about that. If you really want a kid to be smart and keep being smart, whatever you do, don't tell them they're smart. Tell them that they're hard workers. It's uh, a really common scenario. Also, he was putting a lot of energy into the science and into sort of even self-promotion, I would say. And it wasn't going into really self-awareness and some of the social, emotional sort of tasks. So I'm going to read a, a couple more paragraphs by way of wrapping it up. I will say that the people who were worried about Taylor at this point in his life, when he was 16, 17, 18, are still his friends. And um, Taylor and I are, are still close. He, when he saw the book and, uh, you know, he saw for the first time what some of the people that were closest to him were, were saying about him during this period. It was really actually very hard for him. Uh, since then, he was able to sort of rebuild things, and he did it by returning to really his roots. What he had envisioned when he was 11, himself sort of saving his, his grandmother's life by building these, these medical isotopes. And so he got to work in that, and he sort of buried himself in science for a year. And when he came back up, he'd finished this, this device that would allow him to create these isotopes. But um, in the meantime, uh, this, this sort of really, this nadir in his life, I'm going to read you some of the things that people were saying. It, uh, his friend Bill Brinsmead, his, his number one mentor. He said, my, my worry, says Brinsmead, is that it could have an unhappy ending. What happens when everything he does doesn't succeed? Some kids burn out. They're so intense, so young, and they get to be 20, and they're hanging out on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. Then again, Taylor's successes were a relatively recent thing. He'd had plenty of early failures. Maybe they would gird him against the downfall that so many people worried about. Maybe so, Brinsmead said, but right now he's headstrong and he's playing games with people. It may be just a phase and he'll get through it, but right now I just feel sorry for his parents and for Joey, that's his little brother. I'd already confided to his parents, Tiffany and, Tiffany and Kenneth, who looked exhausted, that I was beginning to worry that I'd helped to create a monster with my magazine story about Taylor. I think we'll get through this, Tiffany said, but honestly, Tom, we just want it to be over. We're ready for him to move on so we can concentrate on Joey. Taylor, as a high school student, had already done things that would be the envy of most PhDs. Everywhere he turned, someone was calling him a genius or an Einstein. But Taylor wasn't ready to be an Einstein. And as those closest to him watched his celebrity status grow, they saw the traits that had brought him this far, his passion and curiosity, his exuberance, his confidence, devolving into hubris. Taylor's arrogance and narcissism were having corrosive effects on himself and everyone around him. The lesson of the Icarus myth came to mind. How could it not? But Icarus's story wasn't a perfect fit. After all, Icarus hadn't put the sun in a box. Thanks. So. That's the only picture of Joey that we have with his back to the camera. Very different kid than Taylor. And this brings up one of the other issues when you have more than one kid and, and the first one's a superstar sucking all the air out of the room. Um, sometimes the other one's left with the leftovers. 
Joey wasn't interested in being a superstar. He was interested in doing math. He was an uh, extremely bright kid, as bright as Taylor. Um, but he would, his mother would go into the shower, or the bathroom after he was in the shower, and see that he'd drawn calculus uh, equations on the, sh on the steam in the shower door. He had no interest in being a, a showman like, like Taylor, but he was just as smart. So what do you do with the introverted sort of gifted kids? I, do you want to hear about the time we went to the set of The Big Bang Theory, Taylor and I? That's fun. Uh, so we, we went to um, see the uh, a live taping of The Big Bang Theory. And um, these are sort of excruciating experiences if you've ever been to a live TV show taping of a, of a comedy. You've got this overbearing MC, you know, trying to get the crowd to laugh on the fourth take just as hard as you laughed the first time you saw the <laughs> skit, heard the joke. And it's just, uh, it's hard to sit through. But anyway, afterwards, we were invited down to the uh, cast and crew's Christmas party. And Taylor is sitting on in Sheldon's spot with Johnny Galecki. And he <clears throat> looks over to the shelf. And you can see this on the show, where this instrument is sitting on one of the shelves. It's a Korean War era Geiger counter. And Taylor recognized it. He said, hey, that prop over there. Those things, they, were, they had a radioactive source in them, and they were supposed to take them out when they decommissioned them, but they missed a lot of them. You want me to go take a look? And so at this point, Chuck Lorre is brought over, and he says, yeah, definitely. So they bring a screwdriver, and um, Taylor takes this thing apart, and bingo, he finds this disk of strontium-90 that's been quietly irradiating the cast and crew for the last five years. And, um, Taylor says, wow, that would make a, a nice souvenir. You want me to take it out of there? And, and Chuck Lorre says, and get it the heck off the set? Yes! <laughs> so Taylor ended up with a nice souvenir. Um, this is uh, David Salzman. He's the uh, science advisor for the show. And he said, yeah, I think this will go down in, uh, in Big Bang Theory lore, Taylor, as one of the interesting moments. Anyway, let's. Uh, Let's take some questions. So uh, everything I've read, and I think a lot of people know this, a lot of these extremely capable young people turn out to be just kind of regular old, really smart adults. And likewise, extremely capable adults were not child prodigies. Um, given that, why do you think people are just so like obsessed and interested in uh, kids like Tom? Or no, sorry, kids like Taylor? I wish they were obsessed and interested in <laughs> kids like Tom. <laughs> well, I mean, we'd love to hear it. It's a great story, right? You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing. But you're right. Sometimes um, the mistake people make is closing the door too soon. A lot of kids are early bloomers. A lot are bloom right in the middle, most of them. Some are late bloomers. The trick for parents is to be watching for those sparks of interest and talent and to pick up on them and, and, and feed them and to not close the door too soon on, on a kid who's seemingly you know, interested in nothing or, or a late bloomer. Um, lots of times early bloomers do burn out as well. And we uh, you know, talked about some of the reasons why, it's just that they get so caught up in being that smart kid that they, instead of taking risks and bringing themselves to the next level constantly and, and you know, learning to do things for the sake of, of learning and, and doing and being willing to fail. Instead of doing that, they end up sort of buttressing this image of themselves as the smart kid. So you don't take risks because you might fail at, at something. And, and then you're not the, the super smart kid anymore. You're not the whiz kid. So that, that's a, a super big problem. There, there's a, a theory called mindset theory that uh, Carol Dweck has, has come up with. And um, it's, it's quite interesting, just about sort of how you uh, encourage kids. You just uh, as far as, oh, OK, it's not because you're smart that you achieve things. It's because you try hard that you achieve things, and, and because you're willing to fail that you achieve things. So we, we often we make mistakes with, with gifted kids, with every kid. You, this doesn't apply just to gifted kids. Uh, we have to really 
I think, be on the lookout for these, these again, these sparks of talent and interest and then, then feed them. And even when you're an adult, okay, it's not your parents' responsibility anymore, but it's our own responsibility to, um, to go find the things that make the most sense to us and that we're good at and that we can, can really excel at. Yes? So I'm wondering what you think of the role of competition in uh, academics. So the, um, the US, you may know, for the, won the inter International Math Olympiad, beating China and other countries for the first time in over 20 years. And it seems like those kind of competitions can really be both a cure for hubris too early, because there's always you know, other people trying hard, mm -hmm. as well as a motivator for these kinds of students. Yeah, it, it, it's great, great stuff. Uh, competitions, science fairs, math olympiads are, are just fantastic events. And the great thing about them is that it takes some of the focus away from the kids who are the, the athletic superstars and the, and the entertainers and so forth and, and puts it on kids that are going to find uh, a, uh, a cure for a certain kind of cancer or, or treatment or whatever. And, and these are the kids that we should be making into superstars and, and really you know, pumping up. <clears throat> now, it, was that a fluke that we won that uh, Olympiad? I don't know. I mean, our scores in general keep going down and down and down compared to other countries. And our scores, our, our top t students' scores are, have really gone down in the past 30 years. Um, Vietnam, which has a per capita GDP of somewhere two or three thousand dollars a year, uh, a small fraction of the U.S. is, kicks our butts every year in, in math and science. So I think uh, we have got our priorities in the wrong place. I mean, that's, that's, that's probably a fairly obvious thing to, to say, and it's, it's no, no news. But uh, you know, if we're able to shift and make these kids into some sort of superstars on the level of, um, of athletes, then, then great. And, and that's what really a lot of the physics community thinks of Taylor. They, they see him as a, a really good communicator. And I think that might be his biggest um, <clears throat> impact, you know, beyond the science, beyond his inventions. Uh, I think that he has, has already and could bring more people, get more people interested in, in science, all kinds of science, not just physics. I'm interested uh, to learn a bit more about uh, his parents. Uh, and on the topic of Carol Dweck and growth mindset, it seems pretty clear his parents had a growth mindset. Uh, and I'm curious, you know, was that something they were overtly conscious about? And in, no. did it just come naturally? They didn't know it. it th this is something that just came naturally to them. Uh, they didn't start out with any sort of intentionality to their parenting whatsoever. They had a kid that, that came out on the run, basically, out of the womb on the run. And um, a lot of their parenting style evolved because of the kind of kid Taylor was. And that's what you see with these, a lot of these kids, is the, the, the parents aren't pushing the kids. The kids are, are pulling the parents along into things. Now, um, this, this whole business of uh, you know, this, this intellectual spoiling, creating this, this, this climate of um, you know, emotional and intellectual support into the house that was, that was really quite extreme, especially when he got into these super harrowing sorts of things that were literally glowing in the dark. This was something that they, he, they saw his passion for it and they were inspired. They didn't feel like they could take it away from him. And so they had to, pro but they had to protect themselves. They had to protect the family. They had to make sure he didn't, you know, kill anyone or blow things up or, you know, <laughs> Be, you know, get them all set up with early cancers. So they were able to bring in mentors and, and other learning opportunities and, and really take him in places far away. And I think that was something that was just sort of instinctive. Now, I talked to one person, uh, a child psychologist, David Feldman, that studied these sort of super precocious kids. And he had an interesting theory that could never be proven. Uh, and he's just kind of throwing it out on a on a whim, really, but it's because he can't explain it any other way. Well, maybe just as there might have been a scientist somewhere back in the gene pool that 
resulted in Taylor, there might have been a parenting style back who knows how many generations that was like Taylor and Tiffany's and that you know, was appropriate for the time and the place. And it might not have worked in 16th century Bologna or, or something or, or with a kid who was uh, interested in, in something else. But a lot of things lined up for Taylor. You know, just a lot of what makes these gifted kids succeed is, is actually luck. You know, you, you, they need support. There's no question about it. They can't do it themselves. They need the innate talent. They need um, you know, the mentorship and, and resources and so forth. But they also just need luck. They need the right time and place. They need to come onto this earth and you know, find a place like Davidson Academy and find people like Ron and, and, and Bill that could help them. And that's not so easy. You know, we, can't, we, can, we can make our own luck to a certain extent as a, as a democracy, and we probably should make a little bit more of our own luck in, in that regard. But um, you know, most of the kids that have that sort of innate capability are not going to get that kind of support. And um, they're not going to be able to develop to their full potential as a result. OK, looks like we're out of time. And um, thanks a lot, everybody. I appreciate you coming out. And I'll be glad to talk with anybody and, or sign books or whatnot afterwards. Thank you.